Welcome to the ninth episode in an old season of Amazing Race Recaps from Reality TV Warriors. My name is Michael Harmstone, and joining me as always is a Canadian who, until a few years ago, owned a phone just like the one that T-Mobile provided, Logan Saunders. Good afternoon. The best thing is, that is not even a lie. And the lady who would refuse to use her T-phone to call home loved ones if she were on the race, Michelle Pierce Denver. Mm, good morning. The T-phone. He did call it a T-phone. I wrote that down too. I'm thinking, well, just in case you forgot, Terry and Ian were the older team in the race. The exact wording on it was that he says, use your T-phone to call home loved ones. Maybe he was just too excited. Yeah, I think he was just too excited, because obviously they went into it knowing that they were going to be speaking to loved ones. I think he was just a bit too excited, but it, it did make me laugh a lot more than, than I expected it to. And I had to rewind it a few times to make sure that he'd said those words in that order, because it's not a guarantee. And this is a very interesting episode. It's another rare Switzerland leg that isn't awful. You could contend that this season is the only season to have good Switzerland legs in it. Yeah, I'm on the record as hating UK legs and hating Switzerland legs, and this season has very good ones in both of those places. I think the only other good one I can think of is maybe in Unfinished Business, and that's about it. That's only because of the result, though. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, that's definitely only because of the outcome and the unusual nature of where they go. So previously, five teams raced from Germany to Switzerland. Terry and Ian became public enemies number one to the twins in John Vito and Jill. Laura revealed her feelings for Drew on a train ride. While a foot race saw some teams struggle, but Ken and Gerard checked in fourth, leaving John Vito and Jill to check in last, but not be eliminated from the race. And of course, in the rest period, they're in Switzerland. What else did they get but fondue? Yum! <laughs> <laughs> I like how they only show Flo and Drew eating fondue. It's so heavy-handed, the, the Flo and Drew edits in the next couple of episodes. It? I know this is like the peak of it, and bearing in mind that this did air as a double episode and we have all watched both of these episodes again. It's so heavy-handed, the Flo and Drew in love edit in the next two episodes. Yeah, it's... If I recall correctly, um, this episode was the first of the... No, I think it was the second time, actually. Scratch what I said. I'm pretty sure season two had back to... Either did the two Australia episodes in a row, or Australia, then New Zealand. I think I have worked out why the format of this season was that way. And it's because, with the exception of episode eight, every single episode ends in an elimination. Yeah, they wanted to not have two... Imagine if episodes 8 and 9 were the double episode, and it was just two non-eliminations in one night. <laughs> two hours, nobody goes home. Fantastic. <laughs> there is only one episode in this entire season where nobody goes home, and that is last week. Yeah. It's kind of funny, too, because going into the two-hour episode... By season three, everyone just assumes there's there's a pattern going on, thinking, okay, first half, first half somebody's going to go home, second half, it's going to be a non-elimination. I remember thinking that at the time when the episode aired, and just the absolute shock when you get to the end of this episode, it's like, no, Flo and Zach do not go home. It's It's all five teams still left in the race. They just completely violated the tradition of never having back-to-back non-elims. Hmm. And I like how Phil is now constantly referencing Flo and Drew's romance. It has definitely replaced his obsession with Terry and Ian being old because Terry and Ian definitely get pushed to the side uh, it, during Phil's questions for this episode and the next. Mainly because there's only so long you can go, Terry and Ian are absolutely ancient and decrepit. Will they get eliminated this week? Will they still be at the back of the pack this week? There's only so many times you can do that. Yeah, they're yeah. in it just as much as any of the other teams at this point. So teams, once they leave the pit stop, must now find the Glätzerschlucht, a glacial gorge, and grab their car keys to unlock the next clue. They have $40 for this leg of the race, and the hours of operation are 9am to 6pm, and it's Derek and Drew leaving at 4.55am, Flo and Zach at 4.56am, Terry and Ian at 5.03, Ken and Gerard at 5.07, and John Beaton and Jill at 5.08. That's what happens when you have too many equalizers. It is. And we are reminded of Drew's pre-race confessional, talking about how he's open to flirting with someone on the race to get ahead. And believe me, in this double episode, he will flirt with someone to get ahead. 
and someone will flirt right back with him. It's funny that there's only 13 minutes spread between first and last place. How much can you really struggle at a roadblock when you're only 13 minutes behind the first place team? Well, exactly. His disadvantage would have been having to wait one more time for them to reload the crossbow. Yeah, maybe maybe twice. He missed one or two more shots than everyone else who, who left. That's it. Surprisingly, they're only given $40 for a whole leg in Switzerland. I know what, almost all of it is self-drive. So the only expense was probably paying for the car train. Yeah, but everything in Switzerland is very expensive. When I went there in, what, about, it's probably about 10 years ago now. When we went there as a family, it cost you the equivalent of £25 just to go on their motorways. That's a lot of money. Yeah, that, that was when we were crossing the French border, so you know they probably wouldn't have had to do that. But Switzerland is a very expensive place. So Flo does say in a confessional that Drew is older and more grounded than Zach, which is an attractive quality to her. And I feel so sorry for Zach in the next two episodes. <laughs> yes, I do too. He gets it quite bad. Wait till we get to it, hey? Wait till we get to it. Terry says that nobody has made any attempt to align with them. They've seen as an easy target during the start of the race, and that hasn't really changed much. Ian, th- Ian, Ian thinks they're feared. Yeah, they're not feared yet, I would say. Soon they will be. Did you notice something very interesting about this um, Flo and Terry and Ian confessional back-to-back as well? Here we go. No. Uh, <laughs> no, I did not. Both of these confessionals were taken at the next pit stop. They were taken on the boat on Lake Geneva. Mm, interesting. They are not done at the cabin, where you would expect any confessional from the start of this leg to uh, to actually come from. So actually Flo saying stuff like Drew is older and more grounded than Zach, that comes from the end of this leg. They're just doing it in retrospect. Yeah, because they show the shot of her on the, on the boat outside the steamship Savoy. Or on the steamship Savoy, I should say. Yeah, it's the same background as when she's talking about how Zach's just a good guy at the end of this leg or at the start of the next one. My guess is maybe they just didn't get any interesting confessionals at the Steamship Savoy or at the at, in Grindelwald. Hmm. So the, they find out it's a yet another equalizer because the glitter slot doesn't open until 9 a.m. Stop calling it the glitter slot. Oh, Jesus. Stop trying to make glitter slot a thing, Saunders. Well, I know what happened in the UK with the glitter slut. I think he he got he he's in he's in prison and had to sell the rights to uh, rock and roll part two. <laughs> we don't talk about the glitter slut anymore. So the one other thing that we're reminded of before the glitter slucked glaring at you, Saunders, is that Gerard has two and a half year old twins and he misses them dearly. He's not seen them in absolutely forever. They're definitely setting up the family visit visit in quotations. This is the sort of thing that Michelle in 2002-2003 would have hated with a passion. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's a random It's a random phone call. It's not too bad. It would have been quick. We also get one of the more, uh, more unusual situations arise where Flo and Zach and Derek and Drew retreat to the hotel they used for the pit stop to wait until almost 9 a.m. to go back down to the route marker. So then you have John Vito and Jill and Ken and Jordan very confused when they're the first two teams to show up, despite being the last two teams to leave the pit stop. I would say the only team who was truly last place to the route marker would be uh, would be Terry and Ian. And that's because I guess they completely went into the town of Grindelwald rather than going to the route marker instead. Yeah. I think this is the first time all season that they've not actually stayed at the pit stop location. Because the Chalet Arnica, where they're leaving from this leg, is actually a hotel and stuff. Yeah. But they didn't go back to the Chalet Arnica. No, where did Flo and Zach and Derek and Drew go then? They said they went to the hotel used for the pit stop. Yeah, it was a hotel of some description, but it wasn't the Chalet Arnica. Because it had a different front. They looked completely different. Oh, I see. So they went to the where... So they did go to the place used for the pit stop. It's just that that place wasn't the Chalet Arnica. Yeah. Yeah, they they went to the they went to the place where they spent the rest period, but that wasn't where they actually checked into. Whereas I think every other location that they've checked into has actually been their accommodation as well. Maybe with the exception of the Tour de Belen. Because mm. we didn't see anything of them actually staying in the Tour de Belen, I don't think. And uh 
It's the first of many scenes of Flo and Zack and Derek and Drew sharing a hotel room together for the next three and a half hours. Just imagine being Zack in that situation. Mm. Like he'd gone onto the race, sort of being like, me and Flo, first time ever that we've known each other where we've both been single, let's just try out, see whether we're compatible. And then two thirds of the way into the race, he realises that there is not a chance in hell and he's come on this race with someone who's just going to shout at him now. Yep. Because as much as I will defend Flo a lot in the next few episodes, it's not exactly the most comfortable relationship towards the back end of this season for them. Sad. It, he doesn't want to be with her anyway, but the whole idea is sad. No, I mean, Logan mentioned this in episode five, but if you hate on Flo in this season, you need to reframe it as Flo is really, really competitive. Flo hates losing anything competitive. Just just wait till we get further down the episode. I'm really competitive too. Just wait. I'm saying this as a preamble, knowing that you're going to completely contradict me at the end of the yep. episode. Flo is just very, very competitive and hates losing at anything. And she maybe didn't deal with it as well as she could have done in her early 20s. I think if Flo raced now, she would probably have a completely different attitude, <laughs> given it's 19 years later. And oh, and we get, there are a lot of fun Terry and Ian interactions, not only just between each other, but with the other teams. Because John V and Jill Kench are in, and Terry and Ian, they're just, they're just waiting at the, at the glitter slot for it to open. And then Derek and Drew and... Stop calling it the glitter slot. <laughs> and then Derek and Drew and Flo and Zach just casually stroll up and then Derek and Drew say, oh, is this some sort of line to get in there? And then Ian says, yeah, yeah, we got here first, man. You're at the back of the line. And Derek and Drew say, okay. Do you know the best thing about it? The very next scene, you see Derek and Drew cut straight past people anyway. Yeah. yeah, they just yeah they completely overtake Terry and Ian because it's just one big free for all run through the through the caves. So yeah, John Vito and Jail are open to using the fast forward to not be last in the next leg, assuming that it's going to be an elimination one. Ken and Gerard spot the John Vito and Jail have got a map of Grindelwald, and they don't for the first time all season. And then Flo and Zach and the twins share the hotel room, as Logan said. And at nine a.m., they all enter the gorge and completely miss the car keys. And Zach is obviously the first one to spot them. Once they open their cars, they find out that they have to now drive 36 miles to Candesteg, load onto a car train, and find the Valdaniverse Adventure Park to get their next clue next to the Red Bridge. And there is also a fast-forward clue in this, which is that teams must drive themselves to a cheesemaker's cabin using an enclosed map and eat as many cubes of cheese as they need to in order to uncover the fast-forward award completely, which is hidden underneath a big old cheese wheel. I love the cars that they're driving. I think they're the same cars, or the same sort of cars that they drive in Australia in uh, Season 9, if I remember rightly. I think those are the the Mercedes S-Class as well. Crazy. The nice cars. Nice cars to drive for them them to actually have the opportunity. Because, you know, by the time that they get to the end of Episode 10, not as nice cars. (laughs) I like how when they scramble, because... They really just all grab the keys like second. It's very tough to discreetly grab the keys because they're way. It's way off the path. So if one person gets it, everyone's going to notice. And it's funny when they all get into the parking lot and they all get into the cars. Flo was already yelling for Zach to drive the car when she herself hasn't even taken off her jacket in the in the car yet. She's like, she still. She just got in. She's taken off her jacket. She says, Zach, go, go, Zach, go. I'm thinking, if you haven't even had time to take off your jacket, I don't think Zach's had enough time to put the key in the ignition and start driving out of the parking lot. The best thing is, from this episode onwards, they really start subtly undermining Flo at every opportunity. It's like the editors really enjoy just teasing Flo slightly. Because we get stuff like, on the way to Candesteg, Flo says she can't find it on a map, and she'll be amazed if Zach does manage to find it, and then immediately he sees it on a road sign. Like, they've been undermining her all season, but it really ramps up in this episode and next episode. Yeah, especially this one. This one is, um, I forgot to say this at the beginning too, but I would say you have the the Thailand episode in season one where you have Nancy and Emily eliminate because of the penalty. I would say that's the first really infamous Amazing Race episode that you have. And then you can make an argument that the next really infamous episode is this one right here. I would probably argue Dieselgate is an infamous episode as well, and maybe 
episode four as well. Yeah, I, well, I don't know if Diesel Gates would really be that controversial, though. I don't remember it being controversial at the time. So it's just something that happened. It was a mistake that teams made. But this episode is just, oh, like when Nancy and Emily were eliminated, everyone was pissed off. Oh, I can't believe I can't believe the Guidos were saved. I can't believe Joe and Bill were were saved and that there wasn't some sort of reprieve given to Nancy and Emily. They shouldn't have been penalized 24 hours. And then here we have an episode of, oh, I can't believe production saved Flo with a second consecutive non-elimination despite all of her antics in this episode alone. I think people going into this season, and maybe if you've watched it already like we have, you maybe reminisce on this season as Flo being quote-unquote villainous. Flo doesn't do an awful lot of villainous stuff in this season, I would argue. No, she's not villainous. She's petulant, and I'm pretty sure she would admit that now, what, 19 years later. She is very petulant at a lot of points in this season, especially towards the back end of it. But people have it in their heads when they think back on season three that Flo is this horrible, evil character. And I think if we have one mission on these podcasts, it's to challenge that impression a little bit. Look, she was fine up until this episode. I can have whinges. I don't care about whinges. Love Brooke doesn't worry me. But she just went above and beyond this one. I'm not going to argue that Flo was in the wrong, because she was. I'm not going to argue that she acted out, because she did. I just think that people remember Flo slightly inaccurately and think that she was this big evil character, and she isn't. She was a 23-year-old girl. She'd barely graduated from college, and she was thrown into this really stressful situation before they start properly having personal attacks at her, which people are going to do in the next five episodes, and I know I'm going to get tweets about this. Being like, why are you defending Flo? Well, you know... A, she's very important to the show. B, she's very important to this season. But C, you just have to remember, she's very, very young when she's in this season. It's okay. I'll I'll be with the other people for this episode at least. I don't disagree she was in the wrong. I just think people need to not make it so personal. All right. Let's get down to that spot first. Yeah. So... Everyone catches up, basically. They're all on the, the same train, apart from John Vito and Jill. The cheese fast forward has a lot of cute scenes. Hmm. Yeah, then we get to one of my favourite moments of the entire season, which is everyone waiting for the car train, and Terry and Ian doing their Terry and Ian thing of working out what the next challenge is going to be, and how the Red Bridge is apparently quite a landmark. Hmm. Because Terry and Ian find out from one of the locals who's also on the car train that the Red Bridge is famous for being Europe's highest bungee jump at a blood curdling over 600 feet. 620 feet that plunges. And you can tell that the teams, like, this is that this is a completely different era because teams do get to eat, sleep, and mingle at the pit stops. So. As soon as Terry and Ian are told this, Terry said, Oh, Ian, it's bungee jumping. Go tell Flo. And then Ian said, Yeah, I'm going to go tell her. And then Terry said, Let her worry. And then Ian Ian goes over to Flo and says, Hey, Flo, did you find out what's at the Red Bridge? It's bungee, baby. <laughs> it's such a brilliantly dickish move from Terry and Ian to go, I know who's going to absolutely hate the prospect of doing a bungee jump. Flo. It's great. You wouldn't get this in later seasons because people don't get to know these very specific things about each other. No, and also you wouldn't get it in more recent seasons because you don't get self-driving in more recent seasons. Yeah, I'd, I can't remember too many times they've waited for a car train on the on the Amazing Race. And, and that's the other thing I want to note about this episode and next episode is episodes get really drawn out, I think, by the perspective of today's viewer. Because I think today's more hardcore fans of Amazing Race would be thinking, oh, these these equalizers are all so dumb. It just draws out the episode and then all it comes down to is just the last task and a half and that's it. Boom. So I only have to watch the last 10 minutes of the episode rather than follow it through from start to finish because they go straight into the next location. First thing in the morning they start out and it goes through till the end of the day. 
here you have all these pauses for teams to just play off of each other. It would just be seen as really slow to have this whole thing of tearing in and investigating what the next task could be. What? It's a heights-related task? Oh my goodness, that's new. And then go over to another team to try and scare them. You just you wouldn't get storytelling like that today. I think a lot of fans today would find that to be really boring stuff. I think Logan and I especially have got a bit of a reputation of being crotchety old bastards when it comes to Amazing Race and going, old seasons are better, go see. But the fact of the matter is, we're not wrong, you're not wrong necessarily. I am a crotchety bastard when it comes to certain aspects of more modern seasons, because, you know, the crap. But the things that we like are the more personality-driven aspects of these shows. And you get that sort of stuff in spades in these seasons, and you don't really get to learn anything about the teams until they get eliminated on more recent seasons. There are obviously exceptions, mainly thinking of 29 recently. But what would you know about mid-season boots from 30 through 32? Not a lot, I would argue. Compared to the stuff that you see from Andre and Damon or Aaron and Ariane, what would you know about the 6th or 7th places in more recent seasons? Uh, well, one of them went to uh, has fled to Russia with millions of dollars in crypto coins. Well, yeah, other than sort of the really crazy stuff that you didn't even know about until a few weeks ago. <laughs> which is your favourite story at the moment, and I don't blame you because it's hilarious. Especially after we had a run-in with her. So do you want to talk about the fast forward? Because I've got no notes for it. Yeah, well, I'm just because, as I said at the time, my sister really, really liked John Vito and Jill, so they'd always end up coming up in conversation. So it's just them at the fast forward, and they're arguing about the cheese, or specifically John Vito saying, I, I don't even want to do this fast forward. This is just this is just too much cheese. It's 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 slimy. It's disgusting. Look how look how th- look how thick the cheese is, Jill. I can't I can't eat all this cheese to reveal the fast forward. And then Jill just has to jump in and say. Can, can we not think about the cheese, please, and just eat it? It's just a really fun couple scene, because dating couples are typically the least popular team you find on The Amazing Race, and what's funny now is that we're going to have seasons where the entire cast are all dating couples, but right here, I would argue that John Vito and Jill are, I would say, are the most popular dating couple that The Amazing Race ever had in the first three seasons. They have a really, really tough time finding likable dating couples. They're usually the villains of the season when you have Tara and Will or Frank and Margarita. And then then you have ones who are just not popular at all, like Lenny and Karen. Or, uh, well, I guess Tara and Will would fit that same category too. They're just not that popular. But here you have John Vito and Jill who are just the super likable dating couple. They're not going to get as many insane highlights as, say, Flo would or Terry and Ian would or Ken and Gerard would. But they they finally find a very pleasant uh, dating couple team. And here they are just just having this fun little discussion about whether or not to eat thick cheese to get the fast forward. They're very congenial. They're so lovely to each other. And they didn't stay together, did they? No. No, we are going to. We're going to get to that next week. Yeah, I find it sad. <laughs> um, why did Jill, literally her first piece of cheese, she took the one next to his? Not thinking at all. Why would you do that? Well, it paid off. But right at the beginning, you wouldn't take the piece right next to it. Really, not generally. You'd, you'd mix around the board. But, um, God, he wanted to to leave after one bite of the cheese. I wonder if it was really awful cheese or they're just not used to that cheese. Well, they said it was slimy. So it's, I mean, the uh, the cheese consumption between Western Europe and America is very, very different. And Jill mm. said the cheese yeah. was slimy. And I'm just, and then John Vito was saying how thick it was. So I'm going to guess that it wasn't, wasn't th- thin cheese that you have, say, with Ritz crackers or something. <laughs> I'm going to guess this was because even when they drive up to the farm, Jill says, wow, how is there so much cheese? Or well, no, when they drive up, Jill says, look at how many cows there are here. And then John Vito has to say, well, where do you think all this cheese came from, Jill? So I'm thinking <laughs> this is very fresh, very authentic cheese. So uh, I'm going to guess this was some thick stuff to try and get down. Because of its color, it looked a bit like it might be Swiss cheese, which isn't too bad to eat in bulk 
Can we call this the first gross food eating fast forward ever? No, it's not gross. I love cheese. I'd be like, let me at it. Depends who you are. I think I would have a tough time <laughs> with thick cheese. <laughs> I think it's more the sheer quantity of cheese that you might end up eating here. Yeah, because I, I, no, I don't really eat that much cheese to begin with. I couldn't imagine eating, like, those, those were not small cubes. Those cubes were dense and had some depth to it. <laughs> Especially when you consider these people probably haven't eaten much in the past three weeks. They eat at the pit stops and probably not much else. Maybe on the flights, depending on what there is. And then they're being thrown into this fast forward where there is a lot of cheese on offer. That's going to mess with your stomach. No matter how much you've eaten recently, that's going to mess with your stomach. Whereas I know Michelle absolutely adores cheese, so she'd be like, yep, this is my perfect fast forward. I had cheese last night after dinner. <laughs> Doesn't surprise me. Oh, triple cream brie. Oh my god. I'm trying to think if they did a gross food eating challenge in the first two seasons. Oh, in the very first roadblock that was unaired. That wasn't a fast forward though, was it? No. Yeah, they, oh, I see what you mean. Just for, yeah. They do get carried away with gross food fast forwards. I think it started in in season two, they had a hamburger in Australia. No, hamburger in New Zealand. Yeah, when you start reducing the amount of fast forwards and they start putting more emphasis on making them challenging, that's when they start introducing the gross food ones, I think. Yeah, because it goes from hamburger in season two, thick cheese in season three, to the fat from a sheep's ass by season 13. Oh. Yeah, or the goat's head and or goat's lips in season 10. Or the crickets, the crickets in season nine that BJ and Tyler took forever to eat. See, I don't think that's a gross food challenge. If you remember, Tyler said it was more of a challenge because of the sheer quantity of food rather than it actually being disgusting. Yeah, I think that's still pretty gross, though. I, I feel, I think it, I think that it has to qualify as gross. Yeah, but contrast it with something like the goat's lips or the fat from the sheep's ass or the goat's head in season seventeen. Like, you're going to be way more freaked out having to eat that than having to eat a bowl of crickets and grasshoppers. Definitely. I would argue. Yeah. There's, I mean, yeah, it depends on how you look at it. So yeah, John, Vito and Jill do end up finding uh, the clue eventually. They got lucky with some of their guesses, and they can now drive direct to the pit stop, which is 54 miles away. Montreux, Montreux. On the car train ride, Flo does hop into the car with Derek and Drew, and they're just innocently flirting in the back seat. Cut to Zach in his car, being really pissed off that he's basically been left alone. He just only gets to chat with the camera operator and the sound guy in this car. And once teams do get to the other side, it's Flo and Zach who are first to arrive. And she has severe anxiety over the prospect of doing a bungee jump. And everyone sees the clue box, but then fights over the order numbers without actually opening to see what the detour is. The detour is extreme Swiss or very Swiss. In Extreme Swiss, teams must do a 620-foot plunge off the Red Bridge, the highest bungee jump in Europe, to get their next clue. And in Very Swiss, teams must drive 8 miles to a farm and search around the necks of 75 goats for one of 5 keys, which will open a box containing their next clue. Which detour would you have done? Um, definitely not bungee jumping, because I have done that, and I will not do that again. I think this is one of the very rare detours where the option is Something quick but horrifying, or something far away but easy. Yes. I think you pick the goats here every day of the week. Because <laughs> oh I don't know how you'd psych yourself up to doing a 620-foot bungee jump. Have you done bungee jumping? Hell no. Have you, Logan? No, I have not. No, it's it's awful. Logan's meant to be doing the uh, the grease one off the, uh, the Corinth Ooh. Canal. Oh, can you scream like him, please? <laughs> <laughs> The joke at the time when we did originally uh, start talking about this was that I was going to include Logan's screams in the uh, in the intro music as well. That's good. Logan, you just can't... As soon as they make sure all your, you know, things are on your legs properly, you've just got to jump. If you stand on the edge, you freak yourself out, something majorly. You've just got to jump. Where did you do yours, Michelle? I did mine in Sydney because I worked for the company for a weekend. They needed somebody and I worked for them and everyone who works for them gets a free jump. So I thought, well, it's free. I have to do it. <laughs> it was so bad. And it's... you immediately regretted your life choice. <laughs> no, because you have to do something when it's free. 
you just have to. But oh my God, it's, it's, look, I would do a tandem one again. So I have something to hold on to. It's the whole thing that you have nothing to hold on to. Yeah, I don't understand why anyone would ever pick to do Extreme Swiss here. I love how Terry says she'd skydive, but she won't bungee jump. Yeah, because Ian's scared of heights, so they, they wouldn't have uh, have done the skydive, would they? I think that's why she specifically said that, was to troll Ian there, saying, well, I'll leave the decision up to you. And she said, well, I wanted to skydive. So I think that was her way of saying, I did decide to skydive before, but you didn't want to. So even if I say I want to bungee jump, you might still say no, and we're not going to do that. And I like how Derek and Drew have another car argument. They have a lot of car arguments this season. And this one is about Drew not being able to use a compass. And then Derek says, you have a compass disability, Drew. Derek isn't being very nice. This is the sort of scene that I mean when I talked a couple of weeks ago about how Derek and Drew kind of get a bit villainous in the mid part of this season. You can definitely make an argument that Derek and Drew are sort of the villains of the season for the midpoint of it. And this is the sort of argument where they're fighting with each other constantly, far more than Flo and Zach at this point, can I point out. That does change by the end of the episode. But far more than Flo and Zach did, they're arguing with each other, and then they're doing unnecessarily villainous stuff to Terry and Ian in the last episode as well. And the next one, we're going to have a funny one when they're at the zoo. Um, And can I say, because I am a woman, I can say this, Flo could never have bungee jumped with that top on. (laughs) <laughs> Jesus Christ she didn't have a choice anyway continue thank you Michelle for the woman's perspective <laughs> we also get one of my favourite Terry and Ian arguments of the entire season because they do not back down, they don't back down either of them Terry ends up snatching the clue from him and glares, glares, they glare at each other the whole time and then it's, I don't know why but no one has been as entertained with opening clues as Terry and Ian. Something always goes wrong, especially when they're angry. The angrier they are, the less able Terry is to open the clue. <laughs> this pulls off like a little piece of cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> the tiniest piece of the clue comes off when she tries to tear it. And it's just so funny because Ian just get, initially goes to the clue box and says, Terry, come, come, Terry. And then Terry says, I'm coming, relax. And then Ian hands the clue to her. And then they glare the whole time. She initially rips off the tiniest piece and she's trying again. 90% of the time, a team would just start laughing at this and say, oh my God, I can't believe you can't open the clue. But because it's Terry and Ian and they're so intense and serious and competitive, all that happens is the glaring intensifies and Ian says, well, we're very, we're way behind. We're not going to catch up if you, if, if we're not going to do this, if, if you can't open the clue. And he just says it and with such a straight face. They, they're not even laughing at how ridiculous this whole thing looks. He says, eventually he just says, you need to open this. You need to open this clue. <laughs> Is this the clue where Terry just throws a little bit of the uh, the rip strip on the yes. ground and then just kind of storms off? Yeah. I don't, I just, I'm thinking, please open it because Ian's going to lose it if you don't open it. He, she can't open it. But the thing is, this is not the first clue this season where Terry and Ian have been having a massive row on the way to the clue box. And then they have a kind of a staring match at the clue box <laughs> as one of them is trying to open the clue. And it's so fun every time it happens. And this is a brilliant example of it. I've said this so many times during the season, but how can people not be on board with Terry and Ian when they're just so blindly intense? It's hilarious. Is it any wonder that they come back for All-Stars when you get a performance like this during the season? If this was a modern-day season, what would happen is you'd see a fraction of this exchange. You'd just see them at the clue box and add in a couple of goofy sound effects with Terry trying to open the clue. Mm. But here they let the whole thing play out where they show them walking to the clue box, Ian yelling at Terry, and then Terry trying to open the clue. They don't add in any, any sound effects. It's just boom boom, boom, Ian then scolding there, not in a joking way, just saying, you got to open this, Terry, and then opening the clue. That that edit would never happen today. It would have to be just goofy sound effects and then maybe show one sound bite from Ian, one sound bite from Terry, and that's it. That's all you would see today for sure. Mm. 
what happens normally with this sort of stuff is one of the other teams will mention it in an exit interview or something. Because there were no other teams around, you wouldn't have heard anything about this. It maybe would have been a secret scene and that's it. But this would have been one of the things that would have been lost to time if this was a more recent season. But I don't understand how you wouldn't include a scene like this in because it is so funny when you know that Terry and Ian aren't throwing each other off a bridge, basically, and don't hate each other. They're just very intense and very competitive. (laughs) When you know that about them, you can get away with including a scene like this, which, in the hands of a lesser team, would be spectacularly uncomfortable. Imagine this happening between Jonathan and Victoria, for example. Yeah. It would be uncomfortable. But with Terry and Ian, it goes from maybe being as slightly uncomfortable as they start screaming at each other, to being very, very unintentionally funny. Just the way she looks at him. Just, I'm like, oh, there are daggers there. <laughs> I think that is the key with a lot of Terry and Ian moments, is the fact that you know for a fact that they do love each other, they're just really intense and really competitive, and neither wants to be the person to let the other one down. So you have to frame it through that lens, otherwise what's the point of including a lot of these fun, quirky Terry and Ian moments? Yeah, I don't understand the Terry and Ian hate at all. No, neither do I. And that's another thing, in addition to the reframing people's impression of flow, that's another thing that I really want to get across in these episodes is don't hate Terry and Ian for being competitive and being intense. See them for the ludicrous characters they are, because they are brilliant characters, and they absolutely deserve to come back, and they absolutely deserve to come back for All Stars. And I don't understand how anyone could hate Terry and Ian in this season, because they're brilliant. And what's also funny going into this episode too, I mean, this, this carries over from from the last episode and a half, is... Ken and Gerard and Derek and Drew separate and saying, oh, it's too late in the race. We can't have alliances now. There's only five teams left. And how last episode we said Derek and Drew worked with John Vue and Jill, then with Flo and Zach, and worked with Flo and Zach at the start of this leg. And now Flo and Zach and Ken and Gerard have an, are working together for this detour, and they're also going to work together for most of next leg, in addition to Flo and Zach working with Derek and Drew. Because Flo and Zach and Ken and Gerard are at the... At the, at the very Swiss detour together and just, just they, they, they do work together here. And we get the first major, I think it might be the first major sponsored task in the whole series because as soon as they get the keys, they find out, oh, it's time for the first ever sponsored task for Mason Race. It's funny because Mason Race gets, gets an award for having the most sponsor tasks within each episode especially by present day when you think of amazing race canada how how you'll have tv critics say that it's just one big commercial rather than it be the amazing race but here in the early seasons that didn't really happen at all until we get to this episode because there's a team mobile phone call from home which is definitely not spontaneous because we definitely don't have cameras set up in each of the five teams homes I've got some <laughs> stuff on that. I'm thinking, okay, the equalizer, the very specific equalizers make a lot of sense now heading into this episode. And pro unlikely can show in the time of day that they that they checked out of the pit stop too. <laughs> Cause they have to be careful about what time it is in the contestants' homes. So Flo and Zach and Ken and Gerard call their home. Guess what? Gerard can can uh can talk to his kids. Well, no, he doesn't. Yeah, I guess he just only talks to his wife. Because his kids are... I think his kids are sleeping, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, they're two and a half years old. Yeah, so that's not happening. So he gets to call his wife anyway. And then Flo really eats up a lot of time with with her and Zach because she can't stop talking to her friend until she throws her phone into the bushes. And then Zach freaks out because he thinks he's going to have his credit card taken away. First things first, with the T-Mobile call home, this is how you should do this sort of a task. Because there is the risk and reward. And I know so many shows, mainly Survivor and mainly Big Brother, love to try and influence the the show by doing risk versus reward stuff. This is a brilliant example of risk versus reward. Because teams are told, you can drive as soon as you want, but you can't use that phone in that car. So you only have that time until you go there until you get back into that car, you can use as much time as you want, 
but that is time you will not be doing the race for. So bear that in mind. I wrote that in my notes too, saying this is the best sponsor twist Amazing Race has ever done by far. Usually it's just, oh, look at the new feature on this Ford vehicle. Look how you don't even have to use your hands to open the trunk. It's hokey, but it's brilliant in equal parts. Because obviously it, it's incredibly cringe when they start going, oh, this wonderful phone from T-Mobile. But, I mean, I'm going to go back to Terry and Ian again on this. Terry and Ian are brilliant for this, because they are desperate to talk to their children. So you get so many Terry and Ian-themed character moments just from this scene alone. And a brilliant sponsor task isn't just an egregious sponsor task. It adds to the characters themselves and adds to the show itself. And this is a brilliant example of it. Because Terry and Ian are so excited to talk to their children as soon as Ken and Gerard and Flones that tell them as they're walking up to the uh, to the very Swiss diesel. But Ian can't read the clue, as I said earlier. And then Terry's introduction to it was, please be home. Like they're not going to have arranged it, that people are going to be <laughs> sat by the landline. Yeah, it's just Terry's sister picks up the phone. Oh, hey, Terry. Oh, hey, can I talk to my kids? Oh, no, it's a school day today. They're at school. Bye. It would have been so brilliant if she tried to ring home and someone was already on the landline. Yeah, a busy signal. <laughs> All she heard was the modem noise, and it's like, someone get off the phone so I can speak to my family, please. Yeah, turn in, call home, and it's just ring, ring, ring. Sorry, you have reached the residence of Terry and Ian Pollock. Please leave a message and we'll get back to you. Beep. Hi, it's Terry. Uh, um, <laughs> I guess you guys aren't home right now. Uh, we're on the race. And well, I, guess, I guess we'll talk to you later. Thanks, T-Phone. Bye. Hmm. I would have kept the little kids awake. I think the wife was pretty mean not to keep them awake. It goes back to something you and Ant said on the Hunted podcast, though. At what point would it actually be beneficial for children at what age to be able to stay up that late and speak to people? I don't care. I'm thinking of the earnest moment. Because in, in Hunted UK 1, someone goes home and sees her 18-month-old son after, like, three weeks on the run. And Michelle and Ant both said, basically, that is terrible for that child and should not happen. Well, yes, but that was younger child. Two and a half, you can talk to someone on the phone. But what time would it have been? Well, the the car train was at ten forty, so it was probably it was probably one o'clock ish in Switzerland, at a guess. So it would have been maybe eight nine o'clock in the morning for um for the East Coasters. They're all they, East Coast. Well, the kids would have been awake. They didn't want to use them. They didn't want to put them on. Yeah, it may just have been that. It may have been the case that he did get to speak to his kids and they just didn't film that bit. Maybe. Because Terry and Ian's sons were both like 13-ish, sort of early teens, I think. I have found more recent pictures of both of them and they have aged a lot. <laughs> well, yeah, they'd be older than me. <laughs> One of them has no hair now. That's how long oh it's gosh. been. But yeah, I think if I remember rightly, one of Terry and Ian's sons was about 15, 16, and this one was about 13. What would have been funnier is if, one of them, if they weren't even seated at the table, they, it was if it was a lot more realistic. For for instance, say Brandon was playing Grand, Grand Theft Auto, he says, oh, I guess, I guess I'll talk to them. Let me pause my game first. <laughs> Terry's sister just shouts up the stairs going, Seth, Brandon, come down here and speak to your parents. Oh, let me pause yeah. my game. I have soccer practice. I hate I'm you. Changing for soccer practice. I hate you. There's also another brilliant moment in this when when Flo hangs up the phone and puts it in the box full of straw that they've got to return their, their phones back to before they drive off. Flo says she's the happiest girl in the world right now. Yeah. Yeah, I wrote that. I remember even when the, sh when the episode originally aired, I think when I, or maybe when I re watched it for the very first time almost 20 years ago, where that quote really, really stood out. I'm the happiest girl in the world right now, Zach. I'm so happy. And I'm thinking, boy, oh boy, does that change in about 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just think back to the preview from the last episode where they do show Flo throwing her helmet in that next time on trailer. You know there is something coming when they hear that quote, if you remember back to last week. It's another one of those brilliant foreshadowing moments, where, yeah, they do kind of spoil the ending of this episode by showing Flo throwing a tantrum. 
but also it is worth it for quotes like that where Flo goes, I'm the happiest girl in the world right now. Nothing's going to bring me down ever. Thanks, T-Mobile. <laughs> and of course, the fact that she gets to do all these T-Mobile sponsorship spots means that they probably replace the uh, they're going to kill me and they're going to kill Zach quote on the soundboard. And then, uh, what was the other... Oh yeah, when Derek and Drew call home. There's Nothing really happens with them at the bungee jump. Just lots of... Uh, yelling off the bridge. Yeah, we get a whole like break and a half of whether Drew will jump or not. It is the longest dilemma I've ever seen of this sort. I think it is about six minutes in the episode. Yeah. Of, will Drew jump? Cut back to someone else. Will Drew jump? Let's use another cliffhanger for that. Yeah, and then they call call home. Derek gets to talk to his wife. They're newlyweds for a few months. And then who does Drew get to talk to? He has to talk to his mommy. Hmm. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, that's just a shame. <laughs> so after the T-Mobile phone call scene, John Vito and Jill do check into the pit stop. No T-Mobile phone call for them. No T-Mobile phone call for them, which I'm sure they were gutted about when they heard it at the uh, the pit stop. I suspect they were probably allowed the opportunity when they're on the steamship to call home. Yeah, I think they just said to make sure there was, air, or they got to do it after the fast forward. I wouldn't be surprised if it was edited out. It's not like it's a difficult country to get a phone signal in. Switzerland is obviously very advanced. It's pretty easy infrastructure-wise for them to do that, I suspect. And Jill wanted to look pretty for Phil. She puts on a whole bunch of lipstick for him. And they win a cruise aboard Royal Caribbean's Explorer of the Seas, which is one of the few Royal Caribbean ships I have not been on. Well then. But I do love the audio change when Phil is describing being the prize. It is a really bad audio editing job between uh, Phil going, you've won a cruise aboard Royal Caribbean's Explorer of the Seas. <laughs> and like, usually the ADR isn't too bad on this sort of stuff. You could really tell the change on it. And it's something I do have to draw attention to, because even without headphones on, I could tell that, which is usually a bad sign for them. And everyone else has to then go to the Chateau de Chillon. They can use the phone to call home until they get back to the car. Once they get back into the car, they have to hang up. And once they get there, it is a roadblock, which is who's a nuts and bolts kind of person. In this roadblock, one team member must use a pile of parts to assemble a Swiss army bike. Once they've assembled it correctly, they'll receive their next clue and be able to use their bike to reach the next route marker. And it is Gerard, Drew, Zach and Ian, reluctantly, doing this roadblock. Do they talk to each other in this? Yes, they do. Flo does actually guide Zach a little bit. What's going on there? I think they turned a blind eye to it. Because they were already in last. Okay. It's funny, when Terry and Ian open the clue, Terry says, that person should be a nuts and bolts type of person. And then Ian has a diva moment and says, Ugh, okay, fine, I'll do it. Well, that's the thing. Ian admits, like, two minutes later, after having his little kind of brief temper tantrum over this, that he builds all the bikes and stuff at Christmas, so this is his sort of roadblock anyway. It's just funny, because Ian, Ian does that at every roadblock that he has to. He says, oh, okay, I guess that's me. <laughs> Fine. Guess I'll do it. I'm Batman. Uh, I gotta fix this Swiss army bike. <laughs> Will on it, everybody. So Ken and Gerard are the first to lead a roadblock. I have nothing to say about this roadblock. The teams must now use their bikes to ride three miles to the Bassett Marina and then take a pedalo to the steamship Savoir, the pit stop for the sake of the race. The last team to check in may be eliminated. You know, Gerard and Ian both have the advantage of having of having kids to put together toys on Christmas because what's funny though with Gerard is he keeps saying, no, oh, I think I got it. And then the person says, no, it's not good. And then Gerard says, perfecto. No, it's not good. Then Ken and Gerard both say, okay, it's good now. No, not good. And then Gerard gets it, and then they're good. And Derek and Drew leave in second. Ian does say he has the advantage of having put a few bikes together. It pays to have kids. And he does say that at the pit stop as well. And then when they board the boat, Ken and Gerard have a very long scene with Phil. And Phil just refusing to tell them that they are team number two. It's so good. Yeah, Ken does a whole kung fu leap entrance to the mat. They say, come on, come on, Phil, just give it to us, come on. What are you doing there? You, with that smile on your face and your smirk, come on, give it to us. Tell us what position we are. Give us your shtick. Yeah. And then Phil just pauses even longer and says, Ken and Gerard, and they say, hey, we got something out of him. He hasn't even told us what place we are yet, but at least he said our names. They did the same thing at uh, Neuschwanstein Castle, though. 
Yeah, where they just where they just kept egging on Phil, like, come on, come on, Phil, come on, say it isn't so. It took him absolutely forever to say that they were the penultimate team to check in at that pit stop. But this is the second time this season where Phil has just genuinely had a lot of fun with Ken and Gerard. Well, he makes it he makes it no secret over the next dozen or so seasons. I think all the way through to like season twelve or thirteen, he keeps saying, "Ken and Gerard are my favorite team ever." Ever, Ken and Gerard are my favorites. I wish they were. I wish they they are going to be on an All Star if we do one, or I wish they were on All Stars. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, he makes it no secret of the fact that he really likes Ken and Gerard and put them forward for season 11, and then they didn't get on. But I think this also proves how much fun Phil was having then, and I don't think Phil has had much fun comparatively in more recent seasons. Well, you need you need teams to have fun with you for you to have fun. Yeah, but I don't think Phil has had nearly as much fun in more recent seasons as he did in this season, for example. I would also say with Phil too, that 20 years later, I mean, you have to think Phil was what, in his early to mid thirties at this time. Yeah. I don't think Phil is actually much older than Derek and Drew. Yeah. So he's probably mid. Oh yeah. He'd, he'd be mid thirties. Cause I think he's mid fifties now, isn't he? Yeah. Phil's 54. So he's three years older than Derek and Drew. So he'd be 35, yeah, he'd be 35 years old here. So he'd be extremely close to Ken Gerard in age, and he he wouldn't be too much older than the than the younger teams on this season. And then now, skip ahead 19 years later, Phil is, yeah, Phil is 50, 54, you said? And then casting's gotten younger and younger, so Phil now has to try and relate to people who are in their early 20s, and he's in his mid-50s. Yeah, there's quite a few teams in season 32 that were half of Phil's age they were probably Phil's age put together in terms of seams yeah so you gotta think that's that that makes a huge difference too so Phil Phil is definitely going to relate to some way like Ken and Gerard a lot more and they just Ken was also in TV and movie production too at the time I think if I recall correctly he, he, he was in casting I think so there was just a, there was just a lot that, that Phil had in common with them so uh, I think that that plays a lot into it too. They'd have a lot more to discuss than say with Phil would have a lot more to talk about with Ken and Gerard in contrast to say Heather and Eve or Dennis and Andrew. So I think it's fair to say that the judge at the roadblock is probably a little bit too helpful as well. He just taps the points that people have messed up. And it's not just Flo trying to help Zach. Everyone's been giving pointers. I think the rule doesn't really tighten up until after the first All Star season. Probably after Rob after Robin Amber complained about the post office task with Charlotte Mirna. Yeah, he definitely wouldn't have got away with it in in more recent seasons. No, they if teams would get to a pit stop and then be like, oh well, because you were you helped your teammate and you spoke, you get a half hour penalty. Flo and Zach, you are no longer team number five. You are now the fourth place team and are still in the race. <laughs> So Derek and Drew check in third, and Terry and Ian leave the roadblock in fourth before Flo and Zach leave the roadblock in last. And Zach takes the opportunity to unzip his trousers and turn them into shorts, which Flo doesn't spot in the slightest. Oh, early, early 2000s fashion. And this is after Flo is already pouting on the sit-out bench. She has her helmet on and she's just livid that Terry and Ian left there before Zach did. You know how we were talking about Terry and Ian's fight being amazing? Until this scene, they would have been the banner. But Flo pouting on the bench is one of my favourite banners I've ever used for an Amazing Race recap. Because it's so brilliant for the banner. It's brilliantly focused. I mean, but something for her here, she is totally fine to be totally angry with him. Because what the hell... Oh, my pants will get caught in the chain. No, they won't. Just ride the bike. Just pathetic. All other seven racers who rode the bikes were wearing pants. Zach was the only one who wore shorts. And I'm trying to think, do either of you guys know anybody who wears zip-off pants today? No. (laughs) Yes. Not today. I know one person, and he's my darling father. (laughs) <laughs> so yeah like 
I, cause I'm thinking, wow, I remember in the early 2000s where that was quite common for people who were outside or doing athletic stuff to have the zip off where you could zip them off into shorts. But I'm thinking it's been a long, long time since I've seen anybody wear those type of pants. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I took a pair to Europe when I did my big Europe trip because that's when they were out. And so I, I took them and I thought, oh, this is good. I only have to take one item of clothing and they can be two different things. But they fit really weird. And they're really tough to get back into pants, I've noticed. I remember I yeah. had one pair when I was really young. And to get the pants or get the shorts back into pants, you have to line it up perfectly. I'm thinking this is such a hassle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's people of a certain age who will wear them now. Yeah. I don't think you'd necessarily see young people wearing them anymore. Oh, God, no. No, younger people would not be wearing those anymore. But I'm thinking, yeah, you got to remember those little fashion time capsules 20 years ago. <laughs> but if we're talking about Zach's trouser choice being wildly impractical once he unzips it, there's another really impractical bit of clothing choice in uh, in this race to the pit stop. <laughs> and I don't know whether you guys spotted it. I'm assuming from Michelle's giggling that she did. No, I'm thinking of a later one. I'm thinking of the one in the next airport, the one after. <laughs> did you spot what happened with Terry's shirt? Well, Terry and Ian both really, really stuffed their shirts. Terry's shirt inflates like she's the Michelin man. Oh, yes. I thought, what is going on there? I think it, that was in case she fell, which she did. I was going to say, it helps when she does fall off the bike because she's got the protection because it's basically a giant airbag. But we've gone from last episode where Ian didn't care if her pants were falling down. And therefore, her trouser choice is probably a bit impractical for the bike if Zach's is going to be as well, to her shirt being potentially inflated like she's a Michelin man. <laughs> and then Ian's shirt was really inflated too. I don't think Ian's was as noticeable. No, no it's, it's, a bit more su- yeah, it's a bit more subtle. Because Terry was close to the camera, you do get a good two or three opportunities of seeing her inflated like she's, she's wearing a sumo suit, basically. It's very strange. I assume they had that provided for them at at the roadblock, like, oh, for bike safety, because it is a, it could be a dash to the pit stop, and we don't want teams getting severely injured on the streets of Switzerland. Here, here's some extra padding in case you think you're going to fall. Terry thought, hmm, I might fall, and sure enough, she did. And then we get to probably the moment that Michelle's going to rant about most, so I get to mute my microphone and go get a drink. Flo has a little meltdown when she sees Terry and Ian are on their pedalo. Um, yes. Well, the whole throwing of the helmet. Okay. Iconic. Are you 12 years old? Um, okay. It's okay if it doesn't break, but I think a piece fell off as well. It so did. she broke it. Like, don't, don't break someone else's stuff. Break your own stuff if you want to be a, a little child, but don't break someone else's stuff. And then she says, I, I don't want to be beaten by two retired people retired people they are 49 and 50 in my world i think you retire at 60 65 maybe 70 you're not retired at 49 and 50 oh my god what world is she living in that's it that's me just for my little section right now continue this is just some brilliant editing uh, right here because they they show right. They were perfectly behind Flo when she takes off the helmet, and they show the helmet slowly rolling into the water. And they even have the camera sit on the helmet flowing in the water for an extra those extra two or three seconds, which was perfect. Yeah, there is nothing sadder in this episode than that helmet just slowly floating into Lake Geneva, and then and then Zach just casually saying just going for the boat saying flow they're right there we caught them on the bikes all we have to do is just pedal fast and we can catch them in the boats too because as we will see for the pit start for the next episode they only depart six minutes they're only six minutes apart so i'm thinking if they scrambled off of those bikes and just ran to the harbor and then pedaled as hard as they could i think zach's right i think they do have a it would be extremely, extremely close to the pit stop. It's not like Terry and Ian were, were sprinting to get into the boats and they weren't exactly too fast with the pedaling. It, it could have been a foot race on the boat itself to meet Phil. 
but because Flo was already so just pissed off, like, ah, just, oh, I've had it, I've had it, I'm done, I see Terry Nina in the boats, that's it. Because it's not like it was a short, it wasn't, it wasn't a short pedaling trip to the ship, it was, it was a fair ways away into the water. Oh no, Lake Geneva is absolutely massive. Yeah, like, it was a long way to get there. Because even when they get into the boat, Zach says, we can still catch them. If you, I suggest, Flo, you put all the desire to catch up into into those pedals right now and she doesn't you don't really see her legs moving that fast i'm thinking if flo put it in at 100 percent all the way from riding the bikes to getting into the boats and then pedaling i think they make up six minutes or very close to it yeah i think so and and her being angry when she gets to the boat and there's this men there holding a ladder for her and she doesn't even say thank you. It's just so infuriating for me. I think the thing about this that people forget about is that when Terry Neen checking in fourth and then Flo and Zatju checking in last and she finds out that they've not been eliminated, her attitude completely changes. I think people forget that actually she snaps out of it and goes, yeah, I was a fucking idiot then. I need to wise up a bit more. Whether she does is a whole other story, but there is that realization when they get saved from elimination here that actually Zach was probably right and I think people forget that heel turn at the end. I don't think she thinks that at all. I think she's just like okay we're okay now. You can see the attitude change in her as soon as she finds out they're safe from elimination because as soon as she sees Terry and Ian on the pedal she goes ah crap this is going to be an elimination leg isn't it? We're going to get eliminated. What's the point of me trying? And then when she gets saved from elimination she sort of realizes that maybe she shouldn't just give up. Yeah, she says, Zach's such a great guy. Um, he was so positive. He was so positive. It's He's so positive it makes her mad. <laughs> yeah. She actually says she's so lucky to have him in her life. Yeah, I remember the reaction at the time to when, when they check into the pit stop. You could see it as two reactions. One, she has enough self-awareness to acknowledge, wow, I was a complete... I was a complete jackass to Zach just now and he was completely positive and right about everything. But then the other side of it was her celebration when she finds out she's she's not being eliminated is, wow, she's acting like a spoiled little 10-year-old right now. That's the other side of it too. So I think, and especially at the time after having that massive reaction, it's like, oh, she's acting like, she's acting as if she's such a, spoiled little girl with suddenly being really happy that she's not being eliminated and oh everything's fine now so there there is the there are the two sides to that of course and i do love ian and terry's interaction when they lean up to the pit stop and they're constantly checking over their shoulder for flow and sack like are they coming are they are they coming in the boat and chasing us down and ian keeps checking over and he says uh no i guess they're not coming i guess they're not going to chase us down even though they're really close because they see them get into the harbor and they do freak out and pedal as hard as they can. And then when they get onto the boat, Ian says, up the stairs, Terry, up the stairs. Well, how do you know? And then Ian says, because I'm smart. (laughs) So next time teams head to Malaysia and Singapore, there is more arguing over directions from Derek and Drew confusion as teams try to find a Singaporean celebrity in a very wet unaired roadblock before one team will be eliminated. Have you guys got anything else you want to say about this leg? Uh, no. This is probably at the time of Amazing Race 3's airing. This is, it's where, it's the episode everybody knows Flo for. And maybe even 20 years later, this is still the episode everybody knows Flo for. You could argue with episode 12. Yeah, I was going to say, I think I can probably argue for episode 12 being more the one that people remember Flo for. Yeah, I don't know, just because I would say it's this one, if only because episode 12 aired within the aired within the finale, so you remember more for how it ends, rather than what happens in the middle of it. But I think if you took a random poll of Amazing Race fans, this is the most iconic Flo episode. And the thing is, this is part of a two-hour episode, the Singapore episode next round aired on the same night where the flow meltdowns don't stop in singapore we'll just say that i have to say i love this episode and i love singapore even more singapore might be my favorite episode of the season it's also weird knowing all the landmarks (laughs) yeah we're gonna get to that (laughs) next week so thank you for listening to our amazing race recap we'll be back next week to recap episode number 10 
don't forget you can contact us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram, where we are RTV Warriors. Or you can email us and contact at rtvwarriors.com. Logan's on Twitter at Logs of Kowaki. Michelle is Bear3333333. And I'm MJ Harmstone. Logan and I are also back every Wednesday for V's to Mole, Oregon. See you next week. Peace out and just chill till the next episode. Bye.